Hello and welcome to Discovering True Health, your weekly deep dive into health and wellness. Thank you so much for joining us today. Before we get started with today's show, please hit that subscribe button below. It helps us out a lot and you'll stay up to date on all our upcoming shows. You can also check out additional information on our website, Instagram, and Facebook. All those links are below. Now, today we're going to be learning about how to navigate health insurance and ways to stay out of the healthcare debt trap and what to do if you currently have medical debt. Now, unfortunately, the fact of the matter is that our healthcare system here in the U.S. is a for-profit business for all involved, including health insurance companies. And the U.S. healthcare and health insurance businesses are fraught with confusion, and debt traps that, be, that can become a lifelong burden. Now, research shows that more than 100 million people in the US are affected by medical debt, and 63% were forced to cut spending on essentials like food, clothing, and other basic necessities to pay off their healthcare debt. So that if this is you, you are not alone. Now, while 62% of all bankruptcies in the US were medical bankruptcies, medical bankruptcies are almost unheard of outside of the United States. And the most common cause of medical debt is an unexpected refusal by insurance companies to pay for a medical procedure. So learning how to choose the right health insurance and navigate the healthcare business is crucial to avoid falling prey to the healthcare debt traps out there. So my guest today is Stacy Edgar. She is co-founder of Aventure, where they help businesses offer better health care for less to their employees. And Stacy is a social entrepreneur on a mission to make health care more transparent, accessible, and affordable for Americans. And her mission is personal. So thank you so much for joining me today, Stacy. And thank you so much for having me. We're excited to talk about healthcare today. Yes, me too. This is such a great topic and something I feel like we all need to learn so much more about. Um, Now, your mission and the creation of your company is personal for you. Can you first share with us a little more about your background? Because I did not do it justice in my little intro of you. And also, um, what was the catalyst that inspires you to create your company? Sure. So... Let's start first with the catalyst, actually, which is for me and uh, my co-founder, who's also my brother, uh, medical bills have been a lifelong burden for our family. Uh, Growing up, our parents were small business owners, and the first year of our dad's business, he got sick. And that, that crippled everything in terms of just needing to meet those that actually those medical bills, if you can believe it, were higher than our family's mortgage even. And then, you know, growing up, Tim and I, so Tim, my brother, we both became, he's a, he became a startup founder. He's, this is the, actually the third company he started. I've had a small business. um, And we then faced different versions of this story as an employer, as an employee. For a time, I was a freelancer as well. And what we see ourselves doing is really building the health insurance system that we wish we had mm-hmm. and one that is afford- more affordable, more accessible, and one that makes sense. And this is so important to me. The, the common theme of my whole career has been helping people to live better, just plain and simple. And I actually spent the first 15 years of my career in um, internationally in different countries and asking the question, how do we, um, working with local communities and how do we lift people up from poverty? And this fixing health insurance is the core of that for the U.S. So that's that's what we're doing. And uh, yeah, that's the story. That's incredible. And thank you for this work you're doing. It's so important right now. I, I was shocked by reading these statistics and, you know, how many Americans are going through this. And really, like you said, it's the core of the issue with poverty in the U S which is interesting because then you learn that this doesn't happen in other countries as prevalent as it does in the U S now, in your opinion, from your experience, what are some of the main major issues and pitfalls with insurance companies and our healthcare system 
that need to be reformed in order to protect consumers in the U.S.? And what are some ways us as the consumer can avoid some of these pitfalls? Yeah. So number one is complexity. Our whole healthcare system, uh, you have all these different actors saying, uh, you don't know what to do. And uh, but whether that is uh, the health insurance company, that health insurance broker, HR, like, and then also when you read it, you can, you can have advanced degrees even um, and be like, what am I looking at? And it doesn't have to be this way. It's written in this niche language. And so number one is, um, it's actually not that, it doesn't have to be that complicated. I, and that's one thing we do with our company is try to make sure that we're explaining things in the simplest way possible. Um, not just because that's that's the key to making things accessible and actually giving you a choice over what you're, you know, actually empowering you to be that decision maker. Uh, the second part is the fact that our health insurance is tied to our employment and that you, we don't actually, we're given health insurance. Mm -hmm. That's true for about 160 million Americans. And so like, what if, you know, you don't like what you have, you can't change it. You can't fire the doctor. You, or what if you really like what you have and your company decides to pick something else, you can't keep it. And that's actually what we're doing with our our business is uh we're taking advantage of new regulatory reform that took place two years ago a lot of people don't know this where instead of an um, employer choosing for you instead they can give you pre-tax money and you can choose and oh. that's our model is all about helping personalize and inform and and helping um break apart that uh, that employer stronghold an employer in this model is still including putting the bill but the employee gets to choose. So, and that comes down to the, really the core of the issue is um, we really should be thinking of health insurance literacy as a core part of financial literacy, just like we would talk about credit, kill, but credit card bills or a mortgage or any of those big things. Like this is the thing that can keep you, um, that can wipe away generational wealth in an instant. And literacy and breaking out that complexity are two key, two key issues in my view. Absolutely. Because I, I can relate with, you know, trying to read some of these policies and I'm like, you know, there's all these different factors and you're like, okay, so this one's a little less here and a little more there. And you're trying to figure out like, what really is the best one and what do I need? And that, that's fascinating. You talk about, so, so this is a law that was passed that yeah. we, that any, any corporation or any employee can request this from their company. They can, the, Absolutely. And it basically can replace or can be offered in tandem with uh, a group health insurance model. But yeah, this is something that you, if you're an employee, you can say, hey, HR, have you thought about doing this? The it, the official acronym is ICRA. Okay. Uh, but yeah. And then that gives the employees the ability to choose. Oh, wonderful. So it's a program that the company would have to apply for, or be part of, and then once they're part of it, then they can go on with that model. That's correct. The employer has to decide that this is something they want to do. Um, but it's super simple. And that's exactly what we do. We help, we work with employers to set that up. And uh, I'm assuming there's a website for ICRA that, that I could post a link below to um, for everybody to look at. Yeah. So there's two places you could go to. It's it's talked about a bit in healthcare.gov. Okay. And then secondly, you know, if you visit us online, um, which is mentor.co, you can also learn about the model as well. Oh, beautiful. Okay. So uh, yeah, your link will be posted below. So I'm glad you have that information there as well. Yeah. Now, insurance, com insurance companies are for profit. Don't always have our best interests in mind. Like we just said, they hide this all very well and the fine print and confusing verbiage. Um, what are some important factors and steps to help us navigate when looking for the right insurance policy? And what are some of the main things that we should look out for? Absolutely. So I, you know, I would first say that like, now I'm an outsider to health insurance for sure. And uh, I will say as individuals, there are a lot of caring people who want to make uh, healthcare better. But they are, it is an institution that is basically, you know, it's profit driven and whatnot. Um, and they're looking at how do we make money for sure. But so thinking about when you're looking at that for yourself, um, I would say that 
I would ask any cons- any consumer we work with, we ask like, what are your goals uh, for, and what are your needs and what are, what keeps you up at night? And that's going to be different from each person. But for example, if I'm somebody who I'm just seeing the doctor once or twice a year, I, I'm in great health and it's about staying in great health and maybe even optimizing a bit, um, then, you know, I might actually, you know, under our, our model, I might actually go for a lower cost um, health insurance plan, low premium, maybe a high deductible, but save some money uh, and, and uh, use that money toward either um, putting it into a savings account or putting it into um, like fitness or something that you really want to do instead of spending it on insurance versus if I'm somebody where there's high utilization, then I would go for something that has a higher deductible, a more robust coverage, because um, you're going to be, you're probably going to get a really strong return on um, your money in terms of buying a little bit more insurance coverage there. Um, it's not so straightforward as just like look at the premium and look at the deductible. Um, but that to answer that, that's a bit of a more complicated question. The simplest way I could say is um, if plans are usually, they come in three tiers, bronze, silver, gold, um, sometimes platinum, so sometimes a fourth. And that refers to how much the insurance company is paying. So if you're in a bronze plan, the insurance company is typically paying 60% of the cost. And the reason why I'm saying all of this, and then like it goes all the way up to 90%. So platinum is 90%. So I think it goes incrementally. And um, so if you see uh, a, this is where it gets tricky. So if you see a bronze plan, you're like, oh, that's, that's, those tend to be the lowest cost premiums, but has a zero deductible, which does happen in some markets. That means that some of the cost sharing is somewhere else in the plan. And that's where I would read the fine print. So that's my trick there of like, if you see something and it looks too good to be true, start looking at the fine print. And there's two places I would look, like look at how much they're covering for hospitals Mm. and emergencies. That's where it tends to be like the coverage levels tend to, in my, where I've seen plans, they tend to, um, to have, um, if you have a zero deductible, you might be paying more on those kind of high ticket things if you need to use them down the line. So uh, I know that was a lot, but basically it kind of, those are the, you know, thinking about like what your needs are uh, today and what, and also like, and then uh, kind of using that trick of uh, uh, knowing like bronze, silver, gold, platinum, what are you looking at? And then double checking line items. I would double check hospitals. I would double check ER visits for sure. Understood. So basically, if maybe you're paying less monthly um, for the plan, there could be something in the fine print. Like if you go to the hospital, you're going to be paying a lot more out of pocket. Yeah, that's exactly right. So like I can give you a really specific example that's quick. Uh, the, there is on in, on Cover California. So the state exchange, um, the, there were two plans, same company, $5 difference, same tier. And so that, what does that $5 difference mean? So if you look at their emergency um, line item, one was a 400 flat, $400 copay, which means if you need to go to the ER, just you're going to pay $400. And then the other one, the five, one that was $5 less, it was 40% copay. So if that means, that means that you go to the ER, say you have maybe a like $5,000 bill, hopefully not, you're going to pay 40% of that cost. And that's a really big difference. And so that's where I say, check what, check the hospital and the ER um, or emergency service line. That's really great to know. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, and that's a $5 difference a month. Wow. But a really different risk exposure. Absolutely. Oh, those, and these are the great things we all need to kind of yeah. know. And you're the expert who you've kind of dissected all this. So so yeah. fascinating. Now, the U.S. healthcare and insurance system, like we're saying, it's fraught with these debt traps. And some people fall through gaps in insurance coverage. And even with insurance, we can end up with this absorbent medical bill after a major health issue. So what are some of the important steps to take while we may be in the midst of a medical emergency that will help reduce and manage medical costs and reduce kind of that helpless feeling that a lot of us feel when we're kind of 
going through something like this. Yeah. And the hard thing is that when you're in that moment, that's like your most stressful time. The thing that, and you have a lot of people telling you, this is what you have to do. And sometimes it's presented that you have no other choice. The, the answer always is you have a choice. And at a minimum, you have the option to ask for information. There's new legislation that's passed that, um, you know, like they, the providers need to give you a good faith effort on cost estimates. Um, I, this is different than the past. It's, it's new. So it's not, not, um, so that's number one, like good faith effort on what is this going to cost? Um, one thing, checking if people are in network or out of network, that is huge. So, um, for example, where this comes up a lot is in hospital systems. One um, hospital might be in network, but your um, some specialists within that network that they refer you to may be out of network. And that's where costs balloon, especially anesthesiologists. Oh, man, I was having trouble saying that word, but and that's, that's a common one. And um, so asking because um, that's where the costs can balloon. And then lab tests also, whether it's in network or out of network. And um, that's where actually lab tests is a really common surprise bill because um, the con- like they that provider may not have contracted with a lab laboratory that is in your in network. So those are some common gotchas, but always asking for more information. Um, and then there's um, some tricks like if you ever end up in the um, ER, they always have this. You know, like you can probably hopefully this has never happened to you, but for those of you, those of your listeners who have. You often get this clipboard of um, of papers to sign. So this I actually just learned about. I've never done it personally, but there is a line in there that says I'll pay like whatever, like there's no limit. You can cross that language out and say I will pay up to, um, I believe it's two times Medicare maximum, and then it caps what they can charge you. So um, that's that's something I had no idea that. So and also like um, uh, yes. Yeah, like if they're there, but long story short, you can negotiate up front and ask questions and it's important to do that. So, wow, that's so interesting. So they, they will just kind of randomly or not randomly, but they have ties to certain anesthesiologists and certain testing um, facilities and they won't really be paying attention to, to you and your insurance and whether it's in your network, you have to kind of be on that and, and yeah. sure. And, and to be fair, they may not know the systems to that tell, right? Like, this is not always like I'm out to get you. No, not at all. It's, it's more like they're busy. We're busy. Nobody's checking. And right. like the minute you like, when people realize it is when they bought in that bill. Yeah. So it's, um, it's recognizing that, I mean, especially right now, like our, our healthcare system has been so under stress for, from the pandemic, right? Like, so um, coming in with, I think empathy is really important when we're dealing with healthcare and knowing how much stress that different providers have had over, especially these past few years, but that's not always like intentional. It's sometimes just, it fell through the cracks and that's, so it's, it, it doesn't hurt on our end to be a proactive consumer. Right. And it's great to know that just so you have that in mind, like these, these are my responsibilities to really pay attention to. Mm-hmm. Um, and like you said, um, uh, negotiating, that's a big one that I was reading some story, like different case study stories about how they had no idea they could negotiate and ended up with this burden, lifelong debt that they just, you know, was just causing major issues in their life, but they didn't know in the beginning they could have negotiated that down. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, the other thing I was reading is it was talking about you should scrutinize the line items because those can sometimes accidentally be double billed. Um, some things like that uh, can also be issues. Um, and also, um, and we can talk about this in a bit too, but um, there's something called charity care that isn't always brought to the attention of um, people that you know are getting a medical procedure, have an emergency procedure. Yeah. That's all of those are true. Yeah, there's a lot of mistakes in the system, especially with billing that um, aren't always intentional. And so you could call them out and uh, reduce your bill. If you right. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like you were saying in the beginning, This we need we all should have like a standard course to 
you know, what we need to know and checklists of what we need to kind of, you know, be thinking about and go down this list when we are dealing with a hospital and our medical yeah. stuff. It's so important. Now in 2010, the Affordable Care Act was passed and that was supposed to expand insurance coverage to millions of Americans and limit how much patients pay out of pocket. But research shows that following the 2020, uh, 2010 Act, there were years of exponentially increasing profits for the medical industry. Hospitals recorded their most profitable year in 2019. And currently many Americans face thousands of dollars in medical bills. So what are your thoughts on how and why the Affordable Care Act seems to have failed to live up to its promise for more affordable care? And in your opinion, what are some of the solutions we should be looking at kind of on a macro level? Yeah. So, okay. I'm going to maybe have um, a controversial take here. Hmm. I am an Affordable Care Act fangirl. And originally, why Um, I too was like, ah, the ACA, it seems to have made a mess of things. But fast forward 12 years later, here's something that a lot of people don't know. Uh, Individual health plans are lower than group health plans now and and the way the structural changes that the ACA brought in are actually driving prices down in that market segment. Mm -hmm. And it's not enough. It's not widespread enough. You're right. Like there is like exponential profits still happening. And, um, but it actually, what we're seeing now with the kind of, I would say there's a maturity of the ACA system is that some of the, um, the things that it was intended to do and didn't do in its early days is we're starting to see it happen. Hmm. And so I would actually like, like one thing I also see when I'm talking to consumers is that um, they, they see it's super stigmatized as well. Like they're like, oh, this is worse health insurance. It's more pricey. That's no longer true either. Um, it took some, it took a long time for, it took a decade for that to be true, but it's, that's where I'm really passionate about actually challenging some of these stigmas. And it's, I, I acknowledge it's not, it is not, um, perfect still, but the ACA also made it so that you couldn't prevent, you can't, no insurer can deny you for being sick. No, they can just, they can't discriminate for pre-existing conditions. They can't limit your, your coverage. If you need a million dollars in medical coverage, the insurer has to pay out a million dollars of medical bills. And that is by law that that is the law that made that happen. And uh, it structurally changed the insurance markets and it didn't show up. We, we didn't see those gains in the first 10 years, but I'm actually really excited and really confident that they're going to come out in the next, we're going to see them in the next 10 years. And I know that may be political, but I think it's, it's actually like it, it was a medium long-term structural change that, um, that will be profound and we're, we're just seeing the impacts of it. So right. maybe not the answer you're probably expecting, but I think it's important to discuss and, and challenge the stigmas around that that law. Absolutely. No, I agree. I mean, I think it's interesting that it sounds like it did do good in ways for the consumers, but then at the same time, the medical industry, um, you know, medical care prices were going up exponentially after that, as well as, you know, um, big pharma for drugs were going up. So we, so at the same time, medical care prices, um, you know, pharmaceuticals were exponentially increasing soon after that. So maybe, maybe because of the changes, there was some sort of counter action on the other side or who knows why it happened if, if it happened because of that. But, um, I've heard it described this way, which made a lot of sense to me. And also the math kind of tracks, uh, it destabilized the market. It was, it, it was this huge change and, Actually, it, like if you go back to news articles from 2014, 2015, huge carriers like United Healthcare or Aetna or and a few others, they lost billions of dollars because of the ACA. And uh, that now has shifted. Uh, the market has stabilized. So naturally, also when you see, like it just I think that's tied to some of the cost increases, too, of like they're like, oh, this is this new thing. How do I anticipate what's coming. So um, that's where I say it's, it's settled down a bit. It's not perfect at all, but things are different than they were 10 years ago or even five years ago. 
So it did do some good as far as some of the regulations and protecting customers, but then there was kind of this upheaval where, you know, these the insurance companies and medical companies may be losing money because of it. So there was this kind of whole thing. And do you think that this kind of increased the out-of-pocket costs for Americans as far as deductibles for a while? Is, Is that kind of, that's what it sounded like happened as well? Is that something that's calming down now? you know, 10 years later, over 10 years later, or? Mm, that's a great question. And, you know, to be honest, I don't think they're, my personal opinion is I don't think they're linked. I think there was a move toward high deductible plans that was separate from the the, um, the ACA that happened in the employer markets and um, kind of traditional coverage and as a cost containment uh, for employers. Uh, the ACA though, so like when you accept, when you say by law, you can't turn away anybody. Um, that's going to make everything more expensive. And right. it's taken the system a decade to figure out, okay, like instead of, um, you know, being able to offer this more competitive pricing, but it means maybe that person with cancer is left out to dry that like, instead it said, no, we're not going to leave anybody out, but that means that everybody's shouldering a bit more cost. And I think that's, that's where initially, especially in the early days, that's where the ACA had an uptick in pricing is because they were paying for more to put it bluntly. So, right. Just, and also just like, yeah, I think like there were some really ugly growing pains for sure. So, yeah. Yeah. It sounds like a big, a huge change. And, you know, when profits are lost, they're trying to figure out how to regain them and trying to, they're absorbing a lot more costs as well, like you said, through now they can't turn anybody away that maybe doesn't have insurance or, yeah. you know, and then that kind of makes everybody's costs go up across the board, all the consumers costs. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I appreciate you for, for describing that and sharing that. Um, now people are getting bankrupted when they get healthcare, even if they have insurance. And in your opinion, why is this happening? And what are some of the steps to take if somebody currently has medical debt? And can you speak on what we mentioned earlier, what charity care is for those that don't know? So um, on the, in terms of the, where it's happening is honestly on two places, the surprise bills, and then honestly, like bad luck, like when you have certain catastrophic conditions, like somebody in the family gets cancer, that especially is, um, like there's a strong correlation there. Um, I'm actually, I have to say like the charity care, um, that is, there's basically pools of funding that like, if you are, um, you are in need, a financial need, you can access them through either, um, different providers or different, there's different mechanisms, um, to get them. Uh, but that's, to be honest, that's not an, totally an area that like, I know that much about, but that's like that basically the h- high ticket items are anytime usually you're dealing with a hospital or you need to have surgery or you have an extended stay and nearly every hospital has a department that that ha- deals with this and like deals with like and I that's actually like if you're ever in that situation that's the moment I would ask ahead of time and also um at kind of following up on our earlier conversation also ask to negotiate too so do those and can actually negotiate after the fact well, well, yeah, that's true. So if you're, if let's say you, the hospital sells your debt to a debt company, is that, is that, and, and it's been a bit and you didn't know you can negotiate. Can you go back at that time after the fact? Uh, you know, to be honest, that is probably beyond my, my world on that. But in general, what I found throughout healthcare is you can negotiate. So like, yeah, you I would suspect you could, but to be honest, that's, that's beyond me. Yeah. It's so important to know. Um, that's, that's a huge one for everybody to know. Um, and what would you say the impact of hospital debt is on individual Americans and Americans, America as a whole on a macro level? Well, the number earlier, earlier this year that was thrown around was for all medical debt was 88 billion. And that there are really scary statistics around um, just who was um, who holds that debt. So it's it's in the tens of millions of people. 
Um, the good news is that there was legislation passed that that's no longer impacting credit scores. That's being segregated out. I mean, that's not that's still not uh, good enough, in my opinion. But um, helps. <laughs> yeah, it does. So it's this can be. I mean, for um, I know for my family, it was the difference, which it it impacted my my parents' business. It impacted like how we spent money. It impacted probably also our psychology, even to this day of like, oh, this could happen. So, um, uh, yeah, it's it also the one thing that worries me even more is that the fear of medical debt also keeps people from going to the doctor sometimes. Um, and I've been guilty of this. I'm like, OK, but it's, you know, preventive care is generally free under the for- required and it's required to be so under the Affordable Care Act. Um, so if you go to, um, for your annual physical, you're, you're not supposed to pay anything for it. But, um, for, for me, I'm always like, but is that true? Like, is that like, what, what bill am I going to get? Like, and like having this fear of surprises, I think, um, the, there is also scary statistics that half of people who are told by a doctor, they need to see a specialist or get follow-up care, delay it because of cost. They're like, I know I'm sick. I know I need to get to help myself. But, and then the problem with that is it usually becomes worse and more expensive to treat. So, um, it, I think that it actually, that fear is actually having also a really disastrous impact and also increasing debt as well. So I think that's also where kind of coming back to maybe bright spots as, as like being an informed consumer, knowing, and you know, you asked me questions earlier, even like, I know a lot about insurance. I know a lot about like, um, you know, like where to ask, um, but even still, like, I don't know everything. There's still so much more to learn. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm on that journey myself, but for us to demystify, make things more simple to understand and accessible and for consumers to ask questions, that's, that's, that's the key to resolving this. So like when you go to the doctor, you, you, you can feel like you're, you're going to get, you, you're going to get the care you need and you're not going to get surprised or like saddled with something that puts your family at risk. That's, that's essential. Absolutely. And that's, yeah, I can see how that fear could happen if you've kind of be gun shy once you've already accrued some major medical debt and it's affected your life. And then something happens, you're like, oh, we don't, we can't go through that again or go down that road again. Um, now your, your company, you work with small companies and small businesses. What are some of the main issues and differences with insurance coverage and the plans between big companies and small businesses? And can you also share what your company does, who you help, um, do you help specifically with businesses? Can individuals come to you? Give us an idea of what all you do. Absolutely. So we help uh, businesses to take advantage of the ICRA. That's where what the, that's that new law that we talked about earlier in this conversation. And so what that means is that the employer really just sets a budget, and we'll help them provide that data of how much purchasing power that budget will get them in terms of what are you buying and then that's it. And then we work with each employee and we have an AI marketplace that helps each individual personalize, um, basically spend that money in a way that keeps them healthy and wealthy. That's our two goal, twofold goal for each person. And so our AI, um, it pulls from um, payroll data and what, they, what we know about you in terms of your demographics. And we've built it off of 30 years of medical expenditure data. We know somebody like you has this possibility of events happening to it, to you. This is what it, it costs. And then what we do is we compare that to every plan on the market. And so and then we tell you, this is in your financial interest. This is unique to you. So that's, that's or you may have a conversation with us and you're like, I'm really c- concerned about this, or I'm really, this is my goal. We'll help you meet that goal. So on the, the business side, they've, they've all of a sudden, they get, they've empowered their employees to take advantage of this new model. And then we know that picking health, your health plan is really scary today. Mm-hmm. So what, we're, what we essentially do is give you all the tools to do that. And then we'll take care of the premiums. We'll be there in case you ever have an issue with your health insurance carrier. We will 
advocate on your behalf. Um, and the reason why businesses are starting to pick up this model is um, it saves them 20 to 30% on cost too. So, and in general, on the, on the employee side, they're also able to pick a plan that's reducing their out-of-pocket costs. So it's this win-win for both the employer and the employee. And that's why it's actually, we're starting to see, we started with smaller businesses, but we're starting to see even larger businesses also um, come into our um, fold and do this for their employees, which we're really excited about. We see this is, we see this, we hope this is the future of healthcare where we have more empowered consumers and um, employers who are giving that to their workforce. Beautiful. So you're saving the business money on yeah. their end. You're advocating for the employee, the consumer, and really helping them find, you know, exactly the right plan, but that's also going to save them, them the most money as well. Yes. Oh, absolutely. my goodness. That's yeah. Amazing. You, this, this is a shocking statistic. It, it surprised us too, but it's, there's more out there. So one of the businesses that we are onboarding now um, that switched from the traditional model to this new model, it's a, it's a mid-sized employer, about 2000. They save $7 million a year. Yeah, it's that's that's the power of this new model. And, and then, then all the, yeah, employees, they also are getting um, basically better healthcare. As well. That's incredible. Wow. So it's, it's highly beneficial for everybody across the board. And one quick thing about something you mentioned just previously, you said if we go to the doctor for preventative care, it should be covered as we should not get charged for. Does that mean if we have insurance or we don't have insurance? We wouldn't. If you do have insurance and it is compliant with the Affordable Care Act, again, coming up with the the ACA fangirl here. <laughs> this is one of the things I love it, but like well visits. So one, the, like at, at least if you go for your an, annual physical and you're insured by a, um, um, a ACA compliant plan, um, that physical should be free. Um, you should ask if they run labs that may have a cost and you should ask about that. Okay. Uh, but um, that same thing, like mammograms for women. So like the, the, um, well visits at least once a year are free under the ACA if you are insured. Got it. There's so much to learn. <laughs> so much. Now, for those who want to contact you, how can we do so? And can you share with us any other great resources you have around health, health insurance and navigating health insurance that we can all check out? Absolutely. So to get in touch, um, you can find me on um, LinkedIn or social media. I'm Stacy Edgar. Um, on on Twitter, I'm Stacy May, uh, and uh, yeah, those are easy ways to get in touch or through our website, um, Ventor.co. And uh, in terms of health insurance resources, uh, you know, we are in the process of developing some, so we would like stay tuned to some of our social media. Like, we would love also uh, feedback on that. On like, what questions do you have? What questions do you want us to answer? But um, in general, healthcare.gov is my go-to. It is this like encyclopedia mm. of terms. If there's like, what does that mean? Like, it's usually, they've got a really like, great glossary. Um, and they also um, do a great job of telling you your rights. Like, for example, if there's a claim that gets denied, um, you can always dispute it. You It may not win, but you can always challenge it. And, um, and we'll give you some initial resources on how to do that as a consumer. And that those are my two messages, right? Like, um, or actually, I've, yeah, it's a, you know, be proactive, but then also, you know, challenge, like, like negotiate, dispute. Uh, the worst that happens is that people say no. So, yeah. I love that. Yeah. So everybody listening, talk to your employer and get them to contact Stacy because it sounds like that will help you out a lot and your company out a lot. Um, I will post links below to all of that. Um, before we wrap up the show, do you have final words for those who may be struggling with medical debt or trying to navigate to find the right insurance coverage? So you're not alone. And it is it is really complex today. It doesn't have to be. And if if you're looking for that help, we're, we are happy to help and, and very passionate about doing so. So um, yeah, I hear a lot of people who say, oh gosh, I I feel I I feel like I'm a reasonably smart person, 
how come I can't understand this? And that is a common feeling across the board. And it's not on it's not on us. The system needs to change. And that's that's what we're working to do. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and really, you know, sharing your journey firstly and giving us tips to navigate through health insurance and the pitfalls and how to avoid them. So thank you for that. And thank you also for all the important work work you are doing to help businesses and their employees through your company. Absolutely. Thank you again. Remember, knowledge is power. The more you understand about your body, the better you're able to stay healthy and prevent disease. And a reminder, I'm not your doctor, so please don't take this as medical advice. If you have specific questions about your health care, feel free to reach out to your practitioner. And if you like this video, please like it and share with others. This information could really help some of you me know. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button below and the little bell to be sure you don't miss out on our future shows. And I will see you all next Wednesday on the next episode of Discovering True Health. Hello.